and also one of the biggest segments of our state. To that end, I've asked our presenters here today to speak about one of the biggest, most serious issues facing older adults. Kathy Grunewald is the statewide training director at Florida Legal Services here in Tallahassee, and she's our legal expert. Um, she has a long history of working with libraries, providing legal information to the public. That experience has given her a great perspective on social issues facing Florida communities. She's been an attorney for 34 years and has also worked as a teacher. She's here today to give us a legal expert's opinion on this important and complex issue. Leanna Fitzgerald is a head of reference at the Franklin T. DeGroote Memorial Library in Brevard County and has a lot of experience working with diverse patron groups, including patrons with dementia, if they are affected. It can always have to be the person themselves who has the diagnosis. Leanna has created research guides for the public and taught webinars on the subject of the resources used by librarians and dementia resources for authority. This webinar will build on Leanna's earlier webinar, Florida Resources for Dementia Sufferers and Their Families. Leanna will start us off this morning with some of her experiences as a librarian serving patrons who are affected by dementia. Hi, good morning. So great to be here with you all today virtually. Uh, before we begin, I think it's necessary to define the term dementia. Dementia is not a specific disease. It's actually an overall term that describes a wide range of symptoms that are associated with a decline in memory or other thinking skills severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. Alzheimer's, which I'm sure everyone's heard that term, accounts for 60 to 80 percent of dementia cases. There's also vascular dementia, which can happen after a stroke. It's the second most common dementia type. And there are also many other conditions that can cause symptoms of dementia. Um, some are reversible, such as thyroid problems and vitamin deficiencies. So that's some medical background. Um, uh, symptoms of dementia can vary greatly. At least two of the following core mental functions must be significantly impaired to be considered dementia. Um, those functions are memory, communication and language, ability to focus and pay attention, reasoning and judgment, and vis visual perception. People with dementia may have problems with short-term memory, keeping track of a purse or wallet, paying bills, planning and preparing meals, remembering appointments, or traveling out of their neighborhood. Many dementias are progressive, meaning the symptoms start out slowly and gradually get worse. So the next slide gives you some quick facts and figures so you have an idea of the scope and context of the state of dementia in the U.S. Uh, these figures are taken from the Alzheimer's Association 2016 Special Report on the Personal Financial Impact of Alzheimer's on Families and from the Aging Demographics and Memory Study. Uh, as you see there, one in nine people, 65 and older, have Alzheimer's. 14% of people, 71 and older, have dementia. That's from 2007, so those figures could have increased. Um, and also, as you might imagine, Alzheimer's and dementia are often underreported. So, as many of you know, Florida is a state that draws many retirees. As of October 2016, there are 4.9 million seniors that call Florida home. With more than 5 million residents age 60 and over, Florida leads the nation with the highest population of seniors and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Uh, this info was taken from Elder hey, Update and publication. It's a about um, about people with dementia. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear part of what you said. That sorry, this is Melissa jumping in. That was somebody that didn't have their audio muted, and um, so therefore. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right so. Um, so yes, this info was taken from Elder Update, a publication by Elder Affairs in Tallahassee. Uh, therefore, the numbers of dementia sufferers in Florida is quite large compared to other states. There are a lot of medical facilities in Florida that treat dementia patients, and there are also a lot of support groups to help those affected by dementia. Um, this webinar will help librarians connect patrons uh, with dementia resources and their families as well to helpful community, social, and legal resources for dementia sufferers. So why libraries? Um, if you work in a public library, then you already know that you're likely the first stop on a person's quest to find information to help themselves with a problem. That problem could be legal, social, or personal health issue. Um, 
us librarians have seen it all. <laughs> We've been privy to information we'd rather not know and can never forget. The aforementioned statistics show you the population of Florida that uses our public library systems. Um, a great portion of our patrons here are senior, and a rather large percentage of those senior patrons are also, are also affected by dementia or have a loved one who has been affected by dementia. Public libraries also serve the caregivers that are paid to take care of persons with dementia. Um, here at the group, I routinely fax timesheets for senior nannies, um, assisted living facility workers, and CNAs, um, and other long-term care facility workers that help serve the dementia population. Um, so the next slide shows you, uh, in Florida, librarians need to have a toolkit for dementia sufferers. Age and poverty are significant barriers to access to legal representation. As discussed in my earlier webinar, Florida Legal Resources, a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck make just enough money so that they wouldn't qualify for legal aid, but they cannot afford an attorney. While no librarian should ever practice law, we can at least help patrons access the legal system by helping them access what resources and guides the legal community has created to help pro se litigants. Um, information literacy and language abilities are impediments that keep many members of the public from even using many of these informational guides. Um, further, the elderly may not be familiar with using the internet for their research. So that's where librarians come in. Um, if we have knowledge of these resources, we can help our patrons better utilize what is already out there. So I think librarians can be most helpful when they have knowledge of local programs, knowledge of online resources, and knowledge of where to find popular forms that those affected by dementia are most likely to need and ask for. So those things compromise what I like to call the dementia toolkit. Additionally, if your library is offering a program that dementia sufferers will participate in, it's helpful to make sure that your program follows the appropriate standards for programming for dementia sufferers. Uh, ALA, American Library Association, and other international library organizations have publications and recommendations on this, and we'll get to it a little bit later in the presentation. So that's my ideal toolkit to serve this population. Um, so the next slide has some state resources. Uh, it's important for Florida librarians to have knowledge of where the statewide dementia resources are on the web. I've included some of the best ones here on this slide, and the links are right there. Uh, a good starting point is the Florida Department of Elder Affairs, the primary state agency administering human service programs to benefit Florida's elders. Definitely important to know where their site is. Um, another important link is the link to the Office of Public Guardian, which I've actually been asked for that, believe it or not. I thought it was obscure until I worked here. <laughs> and this is Melissa just jumping in here, and Emily. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that if you don't have uh, Ability to capture all this information right now, we will be sending it out in sending it out in the follow-up email. Um, Elder Affairs is a great website. If you click on services in my area, where the little red uh, arrow was, you'll have access to numerous links to services in your county. So it's very comprehensive, county-wide, statewide. Um, for this slide, I'm using my home county, Brevard, as an example. Um, so. Yes, so you can see all the different counties and definitely explore it, get familiar with it because you'll probably be asked for it, believe it or not, if you work in a public library. Um, the, on the next slide, the Alzheimer and Dementia Resource Center Caregiver Library website is also a great resource. They have local chapters and sections um, and caregivers, as you can well imagine, experience a lot of um, fatigue. It's a very intense job caring for someone who's ill. Um, who's a dementia patient, so it's a great website to know about. Um, and following that, um, there's a slide that has links for social support for caregivers. Um, providing care for someone with dementia can be extremely draining. I've often received questions from patrons about whether, um, you know, I know of anywhere they can go for support. Um, I've heard a lot of stories. Friendshipcenters.org is a resource that provides you with several southwestern Florida chapters bigger organization, the Alzheimer's Association, also has a support section on their website and a hotline number that you could call seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and a message board where you could connect with people online. Um, recently, they've also added a Google Hangout video support group, and they are partnering with 
Hilarity for Charity to provide social support for caregivers. So there is stuff out there to help people that are experiencing that drain. So there's also on the next slide additional links for support in Florida, uh, more local support groups for caregivers. There are numerous agencies and nonprofits that offer support. Um, so there's some of them here, and there's also more in the first webinar I did, resources for dementia. But here I just put some of the main ones. So there is stuff out there. And, okay, what about library staff? 47% uh, of adults simultaneously care for aging parents and children. There is what we, what's commonly known as the sandwich generation. Um, people who are, you know, they've got young kids still in the home and they're also providing care for maybe their parents or grandparents or another relative. So they feel a lot of strain, both from their professional life and their family life. So I thought it would be helpful to include some resources uh, for supervisors. And the next slide shows you some of those resources for librarians who are in a supervisory position, uh, just to have some knowledge of best practices for elder care in the workplace. They may need, may need some ideas of how to deal with situations that their staff might be in, you know, if they have staff members that are in that role of caregiver in that sandwich generation. Um, I hadn't thought of this issue in my earlier webinar on dementia, but as I was conducting research for this webinar, I came across an article um, online by the Society for Human Resource Management titled, Study Highlights Best Practices in Workplace Elder Care Programs uh, by Kathy Kerchik. Uh, the article talked about a 2012 study conducted by the National Alliance for Caregiving uh, that followed successful elder care programs at 17 U.S. employers. The, the study was released back in 2012 at the Aging in America conference in D.C. And the study found that responding to the needs of employees who have caregiving responsibilities does not have to be expensive or elaborate. So if you'd like to read further about this, uh, the link is on the slide. And I also noticed that AARP's website uh, talks a lot about resources for this sandwich generation. Um, so something to think about if you are in a supervisory capacity and just want some ideas to support your staff. And the next slide has some of the similar items for your collection. Um, I think it would be great to have some books on this, maybe in your office or even in your library collection. I did some research on the topic on WorldCat and thought these were pretty good resources on the topic of employee elder care. So the citations are there for you. Okay, and we are at the part now where I turn it over to our legal expert, Kathy. Uh, hi, um, um, thank you, um, and hello to everyone. I'm happy to be here today to talk about um, legal resources available um, at your library and for people who are um, in the beginning stages of dementia or for caregivers. Um, and what you'll see on the screen now are some common legal documents um, associated with dementia. One thing about all those documents is, of course, they have to be um, executed um, correctly, and they also have to be executed before a person who has dementia has progressed to the point where um, they are unable to really know what their property is or what their situation is. Um, so what document you need is going to be um, really an appropriate discussion that you would have with a lawyer. Unfortunately, um, as Leanna referred to earlier, it's sometimes difficult to find an attorney. Um, you can always try a legal services um, program, and if you qualify because of your age or because um, of your income, uh, you'll be able to get a free attorney or maybe a pro bono attorney. Um, but um, other than that, there aren't, um, you would have to contact or um, pay for an attorney and sometimes that can be um, a real burden um, for people who need assistance. So what today I want to do is talk to you about some resources that are available to find an attorney um, and if you can't then to talk about um, um, informational resources that you can use to assist you to um, complete these documents or to find out about your situation and the documents that you um, might need. And so the first one I want to talk about is um, on the next slide. It's called Florida, um, well, 
<clears throat> it's lawhelp.org, and there's one of these websites in every state. Um, those sites provide legal um, referral information um, to uh, lay people. They're all organized, as you can see, by state. In Florida, it's called Florida Law Help. And it's a wonderful resource for patrons. Um, it's, as I said, it's developed for the layperson. Um, and that with the links to all the different states, if you have a patron, which we do in Florida often, who has come from another state, but maybe they own property, um, they're living in Florida, they own property in another state, or they're going back and forth, they need to look up a resource or information from the state that they come from, then they can find that in one of these law help organizations. Um, from the slide that you can uh, see um, that we have on the screen now, there's all types of information there, from fact sheets to forms to links to providers to referral listings. Um, for example, on videos, you can find a video there on um, Social Security overpayments. If someone comes in and looks about that, um, a whole series on guardianship. Um, so there's all kinds of information to be found there. There are also forms, both forms to um, just download and complete, but also automated forms. One example of an automated form is a reasonable accommodation letter. So if a patron who comes in who um, um, now needs some accommodation um, because uh, they have uh, gotten a disability or their disability has progressed and they're um, renting um, a residence, then there's a form that they can fill out and request a reasonable accommodation um, that's right here at the Florida Law Help um, website. The other um, important fact about Florida Law Help is that it is in a lot of different languages. Here in Florida, it's in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Portuguese, and Creole. Um, depending on what state it is, the languages are different. I will say that not every resource is in all of these languages, but many of them are, and they're developing those every day and adding um, the information to the website. The other thing about Florida Law Help and all of the Law Help organizations is that um, they are constantly updated and reviewed. So if you find information there, it's going to be current. Also, if you look at this screen also, you'll see in the middle of the slide the screenshot where it says find legal help. So you can refer a patron there and they can use that drop down, indicate what county they're in, and then they'll be referred to the appropriate legal services or legal aid organization, which they can contact and then see if they'll qualify um, for their services. So, so Florida Law Help and all of the Law Help sites um, are the first, really, the first plan or the first place to go to assist a patron who has a legal problem no matter their age or uh, no matter their incapacity. And the other thing that's helpful in Florida are legal helplines, which is on the next slide. The first one I want um, everyone to be aware of is the Senior Legal Helpline. This is a statewide helpline. It provides legal advice and brief services by telephone to Florida residents 60 and older. They only do certain kinds of problems, so they're not, if you have a criminal legal problem, they won't be able to assist you that, but with a civil legal problem, they definitely will be able to assist you. What happens is that the senior calls this helpline, you can refer them to this, they go through an initial intake uh, with an intake staff or an intake worker, and then they are scheduled an appointment by telephone with an attorney um, in Florida and they can, the attorney can actually have them send them documents, they can review, review documents, they can talk, they can have more than one conversation and oftentimes their legal problem or their uh, question can be answered in that uh, phone call with the attorney. If they have a problem that's more complicated or they need um, to have more ongoing uh, legal assistance, then they'll be referred to an attorney 
who has already agreed to take their case and talk with them. And so that is a, is, is a great resource for seniors in Florida. Another resource uh, that uh, is also helpful is this prescription drug helpline. This is a toll-free helpline that's uh, managed by Florida Legal Services, the organization that uh, I work with, which uh, provides assistance to Medicaid and low-income Medicare beneficiaries who have uh, been prescribed a medicine by a doctor and then that medication has been denied. You can call that prescription drug helpline. You will talk to the very person who is going to assist you and can intervene on your behalf with um, the insurance companies um, and uh, talk to physicians if needed. There are also other helplines in Florida and for these it depends um, oftentimes on where you live. If you're covered by the county um, that those um, helplines respond to. The first one is Legal Services of North Florida, which is located here in the Panhandle. It's really all the counties from about um, Jefferson County all the way over to Pensacola. It's a 16-county helpline. For there, uh, you call into that helpline. Again, you go through an initial intake procedure, uh, and then uh, an attorney will call you back to discuss your legal problem and hopefully can get, solve it or give you enough assistance or the patron enough assistance that they can go forward on their own, um, determine that they don't have a legal problem, or be referred to an attorney to assist you with your problem. All of the, that legal services in North Florida and the other one I'm going to talk about, which is community legal services in Mid-Florida, um, you have to be income eligible. So for those, that's one of the things that they will ask your patrons is what is your income so they can determine whether or not you um, qualify for their services. For seniors, though, in Florida, um, the income guidelines are uh, not the determining criteria for most programs. It's your age. Um, if they're, they get some funding from the Department of Elder Affairs and receiving Title III money, then um, you have to qualify by age. In that case, they prioritize the problems. And all of these are civil legal problems, not um, criminal problems. All right, but if it turns out that you really, really want an attorney and you need an attorney and you don't qualify for legal services uh, because you've checked with the um, local legal services or legal aid program that, you, that your client um, or a patron has been referred to um, from the Law Help website, you can go to the Florida Bar website which has a lawyer referral service. And if you see on the screen now, uh, that service is available online 24 hours a day, or you can call during the day. And you will get a referral to a lawyer in your county, um, and you'll be able to get, uh, the client will be able to get a consultation for $25 if the referral is through the Florida Bar. And in addition, the bar has set up two specialty panels. One of those is a low fee panel, and the other is a senior panel or an elder panel. Um, and so if you are low income or you're an uh, older Floridian, 65 or above, then you can get a referral to a lawyer who has agreed to give you a 30-minute consultation for free. And as I said earlier, often the legal problem that many people have, they can handle if they have some assistance from an attorney that they may be able to get in that 30-minute consultation. If you get an attorney from one of the special panels, um, then such as the Lofi panel or the elder panel, They've also agreed with the, by, when they agreed to be listed on this specialty panel that they would offer their services at a lower than usual fee and they are encouraged to work out payment plans for people who qualify for those two specialty panels. 
there are other resources on the Florida Bar website. The Florida Bar website is um, not just a website for attorneys in Florida. It has a lot of consu uh, consumer information um, under the tab which you see at the top which says for the public. And one of the things that we're talking about today are living wills um, and, and uh, other advanced directives. And if you go there, you're going to find um, some forms available and then referral to other sites that have more extensive information. Also, you'll just find a lot of brochures and other consumer information that the bar updates as well and you can use uh, when you're trying to just get information about the problem or the situation that you find yourself in, whether you are a person who's just been diagnosed with dementia or you're a caregiver, you'll find information um, in all of these resources for both uh, of uh, those types of patrons. Another place to look for information in addition to the Florida Bar is the American Bar Association's law and aging resources. What this has is um, a lot of resources and a toolkit for healthcare advanced planning. And if you look at that toolkit and you go through the different steps, it doesn't uh, have the forms there because forms may vary by state. What it helps a patron do is is to go through the different resources, the different forms, the different advanced directives that are helpful and see what suits the situation that they're in. So this is for a patron who is ready to do some advanced planning. Um, I also want to talk about the Agency for Healthcare Administration, or ACA, which is in Florida. And if you look there um, on this uh, slide, you'll see that they have some downloadable forms, such as a living will or a healthcare surrogate. And the only thing that I caution is to remind the patrons to look carefully over those wills. Uh, uh, when I last looked at these downloadable forms, the living will form, which you'll see there, is a really good form, but it's missing on the bottom of the page the signature line uh, for the person whose living will it is. So you may want to point that out to the patron because they can easily add it. It has the signature lines for the witnesses. Um, but on the form that I downloaded last week, it did not have the signature line for the patron. And the one thing about good about all of these forms that I've talked about today and all of the resources that I've talked about today that there is there's no charge for them. Oftentimes, when a patron goes on their own and Googles living well form, the first forms that, that come up or the first healthcare surrogate form that comes up is, is a form that you have to pay for. Um, these forms you do not have to pay for. They're free forms. And so I hope that uh, patrons will take the time to go and you'll be able to show them the way to get these free forms. Or just say, if you see a form that says you have to pay for it, um, you know, come back and let me make sure you're at the right spot because these all of these forms are available at one place or another for free. Um, and on the next slide, um, I wanted to direct you to something that you might not have thought about, and that is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, they have resources for seniors about there as well. Um, in particular, they have state-specific guides for some states and Florida is one of those states um, for people that are managing other um, folks' money. For example, if you are um, on the agent for someone's power of attorney, or you've been appointed um, by the court as a guardian, um, a trustee, or some kind of or in some kind of fiduciary capacity, then if you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, all, all of those guides are available for you to do either download and print yourself 
or you can order the booklet, the whole guide, um, from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau if you don't uh, want to um, download them or you don't have the ability to print them. And they are wonderful guides. They're very specific to Florida um, because people often end up um, becoming somebody's power of attorney and think there's nothing to it. But there's a lot of things that folks need to do when they manage other people's money and resources and you don't want to make a mistake doing that. Um, the other thing I want to say about this site, if you look at the next um, page, no, it's not on the next page. Um, I'm sorry, go back one slide if you can. Okay. Um, on the, and maybe go back one more slide so I can show this site. Okay, if you look up there at the top of this, this is when you go to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, you'll see the drop down there that says educational resources. And you are going to find on that page a lot of resources for libraries and librarians. Everything from pro programming ideas to different training webinars and other resources. And so I hope you'll uh, use the resources at the um, Consumer Financial Protect Protection Bureau. Um, and so with that, um, now I've gone forward, now I've gone back, um, I'll turn it back over to Leanna. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Yeah, and like, um, I think we discussed earlier how that a lot of times patrons just want to go to their consultation um, and their meeting with their attorney with knowledge of some of the terms they use. So it's helpful, you know, to show them this stuff and maybe give them Black's Law Dictionary or something so that they um, can talk easily with their attorney and get their representation straightened out. So it's really helpful to know where this stuff is because I've been asked numerous times, what does this mean? I, I went to my attorney today and I didn't know. And, and sometimes people are shy and they don't, you know, they don't want to ask the attorney, but they'll come and try to find it at the library, believe it or not. So it's helpful to know where that stuff is on the web. Um, we can start to wrap this up by leaving you with some suggestions on the library's role beyond knowledge of resources. Library programs are priceless to the local community. Uh, don't neglect to serve the population of dementia sufferers, whether it be via outreach or in-house with a program. Programming for dementia sufferers is a newer trend, so there are tons of examples of library programs. Um, I think some of the best examples are the Tales and Travel program and Memory Cafes. A memory Cafe is a themed program where patrons can view and handle items from a reminiscence kit. Tales and Travels is a wonderful program that allows patrons to travel via a presentation with a themed kit. Um, a memory cafe can also be an informal gathering for dementia caregivers, relatives, and persons with dementia. So those are just a screenshot of some flyers from other library programs that support this population. Um, if you're interested in bringing something like this to your library, uh, there is a toolkit for librarians that uh, gives you a sample agenda for planning a Tales and Travel program. Uh, definitely explore it on the web. It's really cool and it would probably be a rewarding experience for your patrons. Uh, here at DeCrew, we are in the process of planning a memory cafe. Uh, we've partnered with the South Brevard Historical Society to get together the artifacts, and so we're excited to be putting on our memory cafe this fall um, for our dementia caregivers, dementia sufferers, and just any other friends and family that want to attend. And with regard to programs, there's a library program guidelines slide here. Um, if you're considering creating a program for persons with dementia, here are some sources that provide guidelines for library services and programs. Um, standards and best practices are currently being established. According to ALA's article titled Library Programs for Dementia Clients, a Literature Review by a special interest group for Alzheimer's and related dementias, the National Institute of Health has determined that creating effective computer training for older adults is instrumental in promoting their ability to find health information on the internet. So even just offering um, a computer class for seniors goes a long way with helping them find stuff on the internet and even kind of access their health care information and things like that. So it helps this population. Um, 
Many public libraries do offer computer classes that are open to all ages. Uh, here in Brevard, our public libraries regularly offer the computer classes. They're for adults, so really anyone over 18 is welcome. But we've noticed that, in fact, most of our patrons that register for these classes are seniors. Um, technology definitely plays an important role in making library materials and info more accessible. So uh, another helpful thing that you could do for this population, um, and even their caregivers, is to have what we call e-reader help. It's a free workshop. And patrons can bring in their device, like a Kindle, um, iPad, something like that. And we help them troubleshoot their device and get online to access ebooks and overdrive and really just anything they need with their e-reader. Um, a lot of seniors I've found receive Kindles as gifts um, and they don't really know how to use them so we get a lot of we get pretty good attendance at those workshops. And the next slide gives you some further readings on this subject. Um, if you are considering planning some outreach and programs for seniors. And finally, there is con a continuing education opportunity for librarians who are interested in this topic, becoming a dementia-friendly library, serving people living with dementia in your community, is actually next week. Um, the American Association of Libraries Annual Conference is putting this on, so anyone that is fortunate enough to attend, you will find, I'm sure, a great session on this topic. And last but not least, um, in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts about reconnection. All of the resources we've discussed today will help foster a continued relationship with the library through life and even through illness. One's connection with their local library can continue despite illness and age. Today we are more connected than ever due to technology and the compilation of years of research, research that is readily available online. All of these resources can be used by librarians to educate themselves on dementia and to help reconnect persons with dementia to their local library. I hope this webinar will help you do just that and reach out to this often forgotten patron base. And those are just some of the sources that we've used today. And I think it also continues on the next several slides. And that's all I've got. Thank you, Lana, and thank you, um, Kathy. Kathy, we are going to stand and make sure we got all your questions answered. So you can put your questions into chat or you can ask them out loud. If anyone has any of their own experiences from, from your library, we'd also love to hear from you. Because, um, this is probably a bigger issue in Florida than almost anywhere else. So, um, Wall Brevard has been doing a lot of work. I'd be interested hear about anyone's experiences in your, in your own community. Okay. Um, so for the programs, like the ones we suggested, the Tales and Travel um, and the Memory Cafe, um, like I said, we're actually trying to, we're working on creating a Memory Cafe here at DeGroote. Um, it's going to be in the fall. It's just so hot and we have a lot of uh, summer reading children stuff going on, so we really don't have the space until then to host it. But um, if you're interested in that, I definitely would encourage you to reach out to local agencies, like maybe a, a local historical society or an assisted living facility as well. Um, you know, for promotion and participation, and we're just going to hope for the best, and we've never done anything like that here, so, but we definitely have the population, um, so that's my experience with it so far, besides the research for the webinars. And I also, also want to say, um, I know that uh, my colleague Julie Bryan at Palm Bay Library, which is kind of our sister library, we have the same director, she has been doing um, an outreach to the assisted living facilities where she goes and reads. So she's had a book club um, there for quite a while and we're hoping to build on that and just, you know, do more in-depth things for this population. Do we have um, any other, anyone else's ideas or questions?
And we'll stay on for a few more minutes, um, make sure that we get all your questions answered. But thank you for being on today, and thank you to our wonderful presenters for all your expertise. Um, like I said, we're going to stay on for a little bit longer.